Corinthians 13, verses 9 through 11. It says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Amen. Then he said, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. So he said that we do things in part. When you think about parts, you think about it's a piece here, a piece there. You know. But he said when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Then he started talking about when he was a child. And so as, as you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to understand, it sounded like he just jumped into the thing, but he wasn't talking about now. But he's talking about when I was a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. And so when, when you're children, you just obey your parents because they told you to. You, know? you follow the rules of the house because if you don't, then there's a punishment that follows. You're going to get whooping. And so... As a child, we only see piece of the puzzle, you know, and, and in your mind, you may feel like your parents are trying to hold something back from you. You can't have no fun. You can't do nothing. You know, they're so lame. They're so old school. They're boring, you know, but their rules and what they see is different from what you see. So you're only understanding a piece of the puzzle. That's the part. Amen. But see, he said, when I became a man, I, I put away child's things. Because when you grow up, you begin to understand that your parents weren't trying to keep you from having fun. They were trying to protect you as best they knew how. Right. They were trying to keep you safe and keep you away from danger. So then when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is done away with. Because now you see a clearer picture. You have a better understanding of things and how they're supposed to be. And so the same thing when we come into salvation. We don't understand everything. We don't understand why they why why are they doing that? Why do they preach that way? Why do they dress that way? Why are they talking like that? You know, they just don't want us to have any fun. You know, that it doesn't have to be that way. We can do this and we can can do that. And see, you are thinking as a child because when we come into Christ, we come as babes, and so we don't know everything. We don't see the full picture, but we go ahead and we. Okay, they said I can't um, go to the club no more. I didn't know that, you know. And my other church, they let me go. But, and this one, they're saying that God is against revelings, and I've seen it in the scripture, so I won't go. You as a child, you might feel like this is boring. What am I supposed to do? You know, I can't go to the club. Ain't nothing else to do. But you want to be saved, and you want to do what's right. You don't want to suffer the wrath of God, so you just go ahead and obey. You go ahead and perform. But after you begin to grow in God, you begin to read his word, you begin to spend time with him, you learn about fasting, you start to do these things, you're growing up. Amen. And so as you grow up, you understand why it was good for you to avoid evil communication. You understand why going to the club is not right and against the will of God. So when we're a child, we think like a child, we understand as a child. So let's be patient with our babes that come in here. You know, because they don't know everything yet. But as they grow in God, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. And then also, as I thought about a child, I thought about the mentality of children. You know, especially coming in as babies. Babies don't know how to communicate. So people coming into the church, they don't know your, your Christian language. You know, what are you talking about? Understand everything that you're uh, referring to. And so children, they cry when they want everything. That's all they know how to do. I'm hungry, cry, I'm wet, cry. I want somebody to pick me up, cry for a long time. You know, until they come, they just cry, cry, cry. Then after a while, they get to walking, they can say a few words, they start saying no, and they see something they want, they just snatch it and take it. They have tantrums, and you just like, oh my goodness, I can't wait till you grow up. You know, I think I said it about all my kids, I can't wait till you grow up. Because after they get a certain age, their understanding comes on a little bit better. They, they see how things work. And so that's how it is when you come into Christ. You don't understand everything. 
You know, you still have temperament. She had tantrums. You can't have your way. They didn't. They didn't invite me, or they didn't go along with my idea. And you know, and, and the devil just come in. He's having a heyday with you. Right. You know, you just falling out. You prayed, and God didn't give it to you, but they get blessed, and now you acting spoiled and pouting. That's how. That's how babies act. Right. That's how they act when they come into the fold of Christ, you know, because they don't understand how everything works. But after a while, we're like, oh, I can't wait to grow up. We might be competitive. They got a question about everything. Oh, just be quiet. You're trying to get your meaning, you know. But they're babes, and that's how they act. But after a while, they're going to grow up, you know. And the things that used to bother them when they were babes in Christ, they don't bother them. They don't run around snatching things what people have and wanting what everybody else has. They're content with what they have. They learn how to be happy and rejoice for one another and be happy for one another in the family of God. So it, it, you see in part, you understand in part, and when that which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away with. And so it's so important that we grow up in Jesus Christ. We grow up, we can't stay a baby forever. You know, when you see a child that's underdeveloped, they're two years old and they're not walking yet, then you know it's something wrong. You're two years old and you're not communicating. I can't understand what you're saying. You're three years old and, and you know, you just really understand that something's not right. Who's going to tell the parents that something's not right? You know, parents can't see sometimes. Oh, yeah, right. It's a little slow. I was a little slow. It's too slow, you know. <laughs> Something is not developing there. And so the same thing when you come into the fold of Christ. We need to be growing. Amen. You know, from the time we enter into our mother's womb and we're conceived, we are growing. And we don't stop until we die. Amen. Even though we don't see the growth process, after a while, you see it. Leave a month and come back. You're like, oh, look at you. You done gained weight. You done did this and that. We are constantly growing. And so when we come into Christ, we need to be constantly growing. You know, if you're just the same way you've been since day one, something is wrong. Something is wrong. You're very, very underdeveloped. And so you need to get into the Word. And if you're not growing where you are in the ministry that you're in, then you need to go somewhere where you can get the truth so that you can grow. And so we, we need to grow up in Christ. Amen. I'm going to read um, Romans 7. Um, I'm going to start at the 15th verse, but I'm going to be skipping around a little bit. But I want you to listen to Paul as he was writing about the struggle that we're going to labor in this morning. He says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. For what I hate, that do I. Meaning, the things that I do, I don't allow. Like if somebody were to come into my house trying to do that, I go, uh-uh, don't you do that anymore. But you do it yourself. So, there's something that's telling you that this is wrong, but you're still doing it. The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I hate, that's the thing that I find myself doing. Verse 18 says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So the will is present with me. I want, there's something in me that wants to do good. I want to do what's right. But how to perform it, how to carry that out, I don't, it's not clicking. I don't know how to do it. It's just not coming together. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that's what I do. The good that I know I'm supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to study for this test. I know I'm not supposed to cheat. But I find myself not studying and looking at other people's paper to get the answer. The good that I want to do, I, I can't do it. It's something that's causing me to do the evil. He says, verse 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin 
that dwelleth in me. Verse 24 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? From the body of this death. Who? And I want us to just kind of look over our lives. Have we ever been there? Are we there now? In this type of struggle that you want to do the good. But evil is present with you. No matter how much you try to do the good, you find yourself doing bad. Mm -hmm. It could be someone has offended you. Right. Okay. Or you heard somebody came and told you such and such said this about you, and you like, oh, for real? Okay. Well, when I see them, you know, I'm gonna let them know this, that, and third. <laughs> and so, as you're going, you're like, well, now nah, maybe I shouldn't, you know, act that way. Right. But then it's like you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna let go. I'm gonna be the big person. They're just they trivial, they childish, I'm bigger than that. You know, I'm just gonna let it go. As soon as you see them, you just go off. All right. What happened to me letting it go? I didn't I, I thought I had let it, I thought I was gonna let it go, but it all, all right. came out. Right. It came out wrong, came out any kind of way. Mm -hmm. That is the struggle. Amen. The good that you wanted to do, just let it go. You know, you couldn't do it. Something overpowered you. All right. And you just had to let them know and, and you know, you know what you did. Amen. So these scenarios, these situations that Paul was talking about, you know, it's just not a one time thing. You know, some people think, you know, this is just happening right before you get saved. But there is a struggle that's going on in the flesh. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to bring you under its power and its control. Amen. All right, we're going to labor in this. James 1, verses 13 through 15. <coughs> says, James 1, 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Evil. Neither tempteth any man. See, there is nothing about evil that is enticing to God. Okay. There is nothing about evil that's going to draw God to want to do that. Why have I been doing this all along? I've been doing all this good. Let me try this. No. There is nothing enticing about evil to God. And when we are filled with God's Holy Spirit, there is nothing about evil that's enticing to us. Amen. All right? Verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, his own <coughs> desires, or his cravings, and enticed. He's Amen. a Lord. Then when lust have conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. There's nothing about evil that's enticing. Amen. When you look at it, it's evil. But he said every man is tempted when he's drawn away of what? His own lust. There is something, there is a desire or craving in you that causes you to be tempted. Amen. Let's look at Eve in the garden. Eve was in the garden. Sir. And he said to her that she could, didn't, didn't God say you could eat of all the trees in the garden? And she said, well, of all the trees we may have except for this one. And he let her know, he said, look at it. You see that it, it, it's, this is going to make you lie. God knows that in the day you eat thereof, you're going to become as God. Wise. She looked at it, and when she looked at it, and she saw that it was to be desired, and she looked at it and saw that it would make her wise. See, that was a, a, a desire to be able to her. She wanted to be wise. She wanted to know more than what God had given her to know. 
She wanted to go beyond the boundaries that he had set for her. Forget about the evil, the death that's going to come with it. You allowed your lust to cause you to be enticed, to be drawn away from the truth. Sin. You see, the devil might come to you and just say, just go get drunk. You're like, I'm not doing this. Amen. Why would I do that? So, he's not going to do that. He can just say, eat, eat this and that. Like, I ain't doing that. What sense did I make? I'm going to eat that and that. Amen. But, he'll create a situation in your life. It makes it seem so hard for you to bear. You might lose your job. Somebody might die and pass away. Mm -hmm. Then he'll come and say, man, look at this. You lost your best friend. Things are hard on your job. You didn't to lose your job. Ain't nobody caring about you. You don't need to think about this right now. I'm going to get you something. Just bury your sorrows. Like, yeah. I feel like they want this right now. It's too hard. They're going to get me something to drink. Then this, they ain't know you done got drunk. You see, it wasn't anything outside of the norm that he came. We go through life situations. We go through hard times. Amen. And the devil knows that. But he don't care about that. His end game is to get you to sin. Right. And so if I if he had to create a scenario around you or, or just harp on things that's going on in your life to lead you to that, then that's what he'll do. Amen. You're drawn away of your own lust and enticed. What was the desire? What was the lust then there, there? You wanted to feel some peace. You wanted to, to escape from what you were going through. That was the lust. That was the desire. Is anything wrong with that? No, I, I wanted some peace, but you ran to the wrong thing. Amen. To find it in. Right. And so every man is tempted when he's drawn with his own lust and he enticed. And that's the enticement right there. It's right there in that place where we got to say, uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not going that way. It's right there in the area that we have to resist the devil. If not, it says, unless, then lust have conceived when it begins to form and take shape, begins to paint that picture of what you need to do to get that thing. Mm -hmm. It bringing forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, it bringing forth death. The devil don't have a new trick. It's the same trick he had in the garden to get us to fall into sin. We got to realize that Satan was defeated at Calvary. You got to believe that. He was rendered powerless at Calvary. And so if Satan is defeated, then our next biggest enemy is ourselves. Our flesh is next to be defeated after Satan. Jesus defeated him, and now he wants to, through the word, and by his spirit, his Holy Spirit, conquer your flesh. Right. All right. And that's what he came to do. Conquer us, <coughs> the flesh, the war that's going on within. When Jesus came into the fullness of his ministry, he gave his disciples power. In Luke 10 and 17, we see how he sent the 70 out and told them to go and heal the sick, and raise the dead, cast out the devils. And they came back rejoicing, saying, even the devils are subject to us. And then Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning, recognizing that Satan no longer had the power he used to over us. Through Jesus Christ, he lost his power. He lost his reign over man. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Right. The word says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. All right. So through the blood of Christ, the enemy has been rendered powerless and defeated. Luke 10 and 19, you can write this down and keep it with you. 
because it is a weapon used against the enemy. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. So the devil lost his power when Jesus came. He don't have power over you anymore. This man that's struggling um, in Romans, he says, you know, it is no more I that do it, but sin that lies in me. He didn't have power. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this, the body of this death? Amen. And so Jesus came to deliver us from the struggle. The struggle, the battle that's going on with him. Amen. We, every last one of us, are the way we are because of the things we have gone through in life. Amen. You, that you are the way you are because of your upbringing, your childhood. Everything has led you to be who you are today. Just kind of reflect on your life. The hurts, the disappointments, the joys, the people that left you, the people that stayed. They have impacted your life. It affects everything that you do. It affects how you love people. Amen. If you were a child that received love, y'all hugged all the time, I love you, you know, you just so lovey. You might get on people and are like, why are you always smiling? Oh my goodness. You know, and they're there that way because they didn't grow up in a loving family. All right. We didn't do that. I never heard my parents say I love you. I knew they loved me because they bought me stuff. And so that's how they identified love. I buy you stuff. I bought you something. Why you, how can you say they love you? Spent two hundred dollars on you. That's love. <laughs> you know. And to you it's like, I just want I just want to hear it. Right. And to them that makes no sense. I love you or two hundred dollars. So how you were brought up affects how you are today. Our temperaments, our habits, whether they're good or bad habits, the way we talk to people, the way some of us laugh when we see somebody fall, or some of us choose not to laugh when we see somebody fall. It affects you. The way we feel about people that are different from us, that have a different race or background. Right. Some of us might, might have been that child in school that was shunned and nobody talked to you because of whatever. So when you see people isolating themselves, you go to them. You try to make them feel fit in because you know what that felt like. Amen. All of these things have made us who we are today. Psalms 51 and 5, David said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. A lot of us have been shaped in iniquity by the world we live in, and we don't even realize it. Amen. <laughs> If you study, and I, and I, please study, look at sin and iniquity. They're always separate. Sin and iniquity. Sin and iniquity. Is it sin, iniquity, or iniquity, sin? Why well, are they always separate? I just started studying, looking at all the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit began to show me what iniquity was. We know what sin is. A lot of times we can see it on people. You know, <clears throat> it's an outward show of something that you've done, you've committed. It's an act, you know, whether it's fornication, adultery, you stole something, you lied, you cheated, you know, it's something that you did, you committed the sin. Iniquity takes place somewhere a little bit more hidden in your heart. Nobody sees it. Sometimes you don't even see it and recognize it, but God sees it. When we begin, and we're always categorizing and sorting people like we sort clothes. We're grouping them off according to status and relations, All right. income, credit scores, their odor, or their intellect. We have practiced iniquity without knowing. <coughs> it becomes a part of who we are and our preference to people. If you had a choice, you walked into a waiting room and you had a choice to sit next to somebody 
and you saw a white person and you saw a black person and you said, I'm not going to sit over here because of whatever your reason is. The fact is, you need to sit down somewhere. Amen. It shouldn't matter what color the people are you sit by. Yes, the race they are. That's right. You just need to sit down. That's right. Inequity without even realizing. Or if you're in a, ra a waiting room, there are hardly any seats in the room, you've are, you're already there. You've got your, your belongings next to you. Someone walks in and they're not so attractive. They look like they had a hard day at work. You are so glad you have your belongings in your seat. All right. But then somebody walks in, they're very well dressed for my singles. And you like, oh. <laughs> hey, man. Mm -hmm. All right. It is nothing, it had nothing to do with the person that walked in. They just needed to see. It had everything to do with what was in your heart. Man. And see, that's something casual, it just happened, it went past, he said, way over there, you forgot all about the situation, you went on to the doctor's appointment. But God saw your heart, right. and he sees how we're treating people because of what we have allowed, whether it was the world that we live in, our influences, our education, whatever it was to shape us this way. And so until we die to who we are, Amen. those type of likes and dislikes, until we die to who we are, Christ will never be seen in our life. Because we'll always have these stipulations, we'll always have these little categories, and we'll always be in a little box. Amen. We'll never be able to love the way we're supposed to love. We'll never come to be perfect All right. the way God wants to perform. Us. Amen. 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 You know, it, it's it's not our fault. You know, we didn't make us. Amen. But when we come into the knowledge of knowing, then we can do something. All right. We begin to pray. And now you're gonna begin to recognize and see. You know, I have a, a thing with repetitive noise. Amen. That's just me. I don't like repetitive noise. Exactly. Amen. My brother-in-law came to my house the other day, and his phone just goes off like every 30 seconds. The same little noise. And at first I was like, oh, what's that noise? You know, so I was at my phone. I'm like, oh, okay. That noise is just bothering me so much. I had to pray to wash the dishes and keep on and cook and eat and have a conversation. What that noise? Just keep on going on. Because I did not want this thing to have power over me. Because sometimes we can be the way that we are in our heart and it can cause us to mistreat people. Amen. I could have said, don't you hear that phone going out? Won't you turn it down or something? Amen. Then I would have got all out of sorts. Why? Anyway, what's wrong with us? Because of what's in me. Amen. And so there's some things that's in us. It's not sin. It's not sinful. It's okay. You don't like pressing noise. But don't let those things cause you to be moved from being Christ-like right. and then to attack or say, she, how could you like that? You know, some people might prefer a, a certain color that you detest. And that's how, the color they want to paint their house. And you just frown in it. Oh, what, what is wrong with you? Why would you even think that? You, you making them feel all bad? That's just you. It's okay. And so there are some things about ourselves that's in our flesh. You know, the enemy don't care what he uses. Okay, she's just a little house mama. She's just going along and doing all this, that, and the third. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit this button right here in her flesh and just send people her way. It's gonna keep on aggravating her. So she act out of sorts. But if you have died and crucified this flesh, 
Matthew 26 and 41, Jesus said, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We got to understand, Jesus said when he came, he condemned sin in the flesh. Sin is condemned in your flesh. It's stuck there. It won't, it can't get out unless you let it out. And we got to keep it under the suggestion of Jesus Christ. All right. That doesn't mean just because I got saved, I will never sin. Do I have to sin? You don't. Amen. But you are capable because you're still living in this body of flesh. Amen. But through Jesus Christ, he can put it under subjection. Amen. Some of us may not understand the war and the battle that's going on within. So I just want to paint a little picture. How many of us have ever fasted? Isn't it strange how the moment you make up your mind, I'm going to fast, you get so hungry, mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah, you could have gone the whole day and be like, oh, I forgot to eat. But within an hour, your stomach is rumbling. Oh, <laughs> and then the war is on. Why don't you just pray a little longer? Just read some more scripture. You fasted long enough. It is just up your flesh don't want to that's the war. Your flesh don't want to die. It don't want to do nothing good. And so it begins to struggle. Or have you ever decided you got a lump sum of money? You say, I'm gonna give sister so and so five hundred dollars. And as the day become approaching, I'm going to give Sister So-and-so $300. Yeah. <laughs> and by the time you get to So-and-so, she's going to be happy with $100. I'm going to buy her a car and put it in there. Right. The flesh done talked you down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because it got to thinking, well, if you give her this much, then you ain't going to be able to do this and you give her that much. She don't really know you're going to give it to her anyway. Just give her $100. She'll be happy with that. Amen. Just be happy about it. Say, be a cheerful giver. It was up to you how much to give in the first place. You ain't got to give that. Much. That's the flesh. Amen. That's the war. All right. And it, it, it starts the moment you try to do something good. Children, you might have a favorite toy. And your mama said, I want y'all to give away some nice toys. We're getting ready to get uh, some things at Goodwill or go get some things. And you think about that nice toy. I'm going to give them this. You so happy, then you go up there and you start thinking about it. You're like, oh, this play pretty good. I'm gonna get a this. Get a this. Oh, oh that too. That's pretty good too. They should be happy with this. They ain't used to not having nothing. I'm gonna give them this. That's the war of the flesh. Right. And it starts. I'm telling you, it's there. And so we gotta learn how to crucify this flesh. Jesus knew that we were going to need someone stronger than ourselves to conquer the flesh. That's right. And that's why he left us his Holy Spirit. Amen. That's why he sent back the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, he is our power source. Amen. Because without him, we're going to be led by the flesh every day. When we get mad, we're going to say what's on our mind. We're going to make sure we don't curse because we want to stay safe. Amen. But that it's, it's beyond not cursing. It's beyond that. God want to take away that button that people can push. Amen. That is no more button. You're at peace. All right. Just cuss you out. You ain't gonna say What you gonna do? I'm gonna pray for them. Because if, if they die in that state, they're going to hell. He want to remove that part of you. And so he said, you can't do it on your own. Amen. He'll send you some help. He sent us the Holy Ghost. Acts 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. And you shall be my witnesses. He's going to give us power. Power. John, John 1, 11 through 12 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. 
Amen. We need the Holy Spirit of the living God walking with us, living in us to do battle with the flesh. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit to change us from who we are. Take away the iniquity of my heart. Take away the deep things in my, in my heart that I don't see. The Lord gave me a dream one time. And this is when he was showing me these things. He gave me a dream. And in this dream, I was getting ready to order some food. And there was this young white guy came and he stood next to me. And I said to myself, he's cute, poor white guy. And it was as though he read my thoughts. And he looked at me and just kind of shook his head like he was sad that I thought that. And I'm thinking like, what? I'm thinking like, what? I gave you a compliment. And so then, he told me to come here. And I, I followed him and I went down this, this path and he pointed down the alley. And I, I looked down the alley, I seen some black, some black folks. There were some girls that had like red hair and tight pants. And, you know, I was like, ooh, they're not my type of people. I was trying to let him know. That's not my type of people that I hang out with, you know. And he looked at me and he shook his head. He was so sad. And then he pointed to another group of girls. These group of girls, they just had the hair on me. They looked more fair. I said, now them, that's my type of people that I hang out with. And he looked at me. He was so sad. And I woke up. And I was like, what? I was like, what in the world? And he showed me. You know, even my comment, you know, you're cute for a white guy. You categorized him. You, you called those, you didn't even know those people. You just disassociated your people, yourself with them. These people you didn't even know either. You just identified with them because you thought they were better. And he showed me the hidden iniquity of my heart. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I'd do that. I might walk down and see some, oh, she's like, get up. You know, you don't even know her. But you just seen her and you saw how she looked and you categorized her. Amen. You know, and so we have done, we do this. Amen. Born into sin, shaping in iniquity, not even realize the deep things hidden in our heart. And so my friend was like, Lord, remove things in my heart that I don't know. Amen. You know, you think you're so holy, you're so righteous and upright, and here comes some light shining on your life to just show you a little bit more about yourself you need to get rid of. If you want to be like Christ. Because I am convinced that Christ looked at men and he didn't see the color of their skin. He did not see their status and their income. He didn't just care how they smelled or what size they were. But he saw people hurting, lost, desperate, in need of a savior. And he was there for them and he ministered to them. And he saw little old Zacchaeus climbing up that tree trying to see him. He said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm coming to your house today. Amen. When he came, his whole household was saved. That's the Jesus that wants to live in us today. So where I can use me, God. I can use Didi because they're going to look on people and they're not going to see them. They're going to see a soul that needs to be saved. Amen. They're going to love them regardless of their status, regardless of their income, regardless of their race. Those are the type of people that God needs to use today. Amen. Because the world is dying and they need a Savior. Amen. When Jesus came to save the world. Right. from sin. The whole world from sin. Amen. Amen. He says, Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. It is imperative that we are filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. We ask him, God, send me your Holy Spirit. His job is to lead you and guide you into all truth. All truth. Yes, he's going to help you with the doctrines about marriage and divorce. He's going to help you with the doctrines, you know, about whatever else you need to learn. The basic doctrines we preach about salvation, what it means to be saved, and, you know, justification and sanctification. He's going to teach you those things. But then he's going to teach you the things that nobody else can teach you. Amen. He's going to show you things about yourself that's not written in this book. Amen. But it can be confirmed through the Word. All right. That nobody else can show you. And so you need the Holy Spirit to come. Come and be with me. Come Amen. and sit with me as a refiner and a purifier. 
burning those things out of my heart that don't run. Jesus came to deliver us from sin to escape the wrath of God, but he came to help us to live holy. Some people waiting for a supernatural experience to happen. I heard a testimony of this man when I was a little girl in East Atlanta. He got up, he said he asked for the Holy Ghost. He had been waiting for the Holy Ghost, waiting for the Holy Ghost to come. Then he said one day he was laying on his bed and he felt something go through his hand and his hand started moving. And it went to the other hand. And the other hand started moving. And he just started shaking. And he just started, I got him! I got him! And he ran outside. I got the Holy Ghost! Okay. And I was like, oh. Whew. I want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I want the Holy Ghost too. <laughs> I realize now we got something else. <laughs> I realize now that the Holy Ghost is a meek and quiet spirit. He don't just come and overtake your body. He calls you to start moving and going on. But as a child, I didn't know. And so we need the real Holy Ghost to come. Because when the real Holy Ghost comes, he came to reprove you of sin. He came to lead you and to guide you in all truth. Amen. Ain't no supernatural phenomenal thing gonna happen to your body. Right. And if you look at Jesus, he got baptized, and the Holy Ghost descended upon him as a dove. Amen. And then he went into his ministry. Amen. He began to preach the gospel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if you want to do more than what Jesus did, you might need to go somewhere else. Amen. Because Jesus came to help us to live a holy life. Right, when he man. came, he showed us how to love. Amen. How to love the Father. He acknowledged him. He acknowledged God. He would just stop and say, Father, I know that you're with me. But for the sake of living in peace, Lord, glorify thyself. You know, he would just acknowledge him. He Amen. kept telling people about his Father in heaven. He just kept on preaching the gospel. Then they come and he had the power to heal and lay hands on through the power of the Holy Ghost now. Yeah? To heal and lay hands and he lived a holy life. He lived a clean life. So that's what he came to help us to do. Right. Live a holy life. Teach you how to love God with all your heart and how to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Some people think that's just too simple. We got to do something else. Phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Right. That is phenomenal. Right. When somebody can mistreat you and it intentionally hurt you, but you turn around and you pray a firm and pray for them. Or when you see them in need, you move on compact with compassion to help them. That's for them. That's what God wants to do in the heart of the believer. We are constantly under attack of the enemy. Constantly under the under the attack of unclean spirits. Ephesians 6 and 10 says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, the devil got tricks. He got tricks, traps set for you because he knows evil ain't going to do it. But if I lay this trick out, you know, I try to set a trap for them to fall in. Then I could possibly get them. But he said, if you put on the whole armor of God, you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are constantly being attacked by spirits that know how to hone in on the weaknesses of our flesh. They know how to find what's weak in your flesh. We cannot settle for the works of the flesh by saying, that's the way I've been my whole life, or my family's like this, and I'm just not going to change. It's just how we are. That's settling. And when you do that, that was happy. Because he's going to send a spirit to help you. You know, you might have a problem with how you talk to people. You don't know how to season your words. When the word says season your words with grace, and people come to you, what do you think about, what do you think about my hair? Oh, that's ugly. Why did you even do it like that? 
It shapes you.